Tokenmetrics is a cryptocurrency investment platform that helps users leverage machine learning to become better crypto investors. Our in-depth analysis helps eliminate the emotions of investing, find profitable investment opportunities, and filters out scams. Learn more at tokenmetrics.com. We are live. Welcome to the Market Update Show. I'm your host, Bill Noble. This show is brought to you by tokenmetrics.com. If you need a roadmap in crypto and you need to navigate what's happening, subscribe to this channel. If you need to know when we're on the air, please hit the bell and subscribe and turn on alerts. Today, we're going to go over legacy and crypto. So we're going to come up with a Fed plan together after yesterday's total insanity. So welcoming us to the stream, we have Omar first, followed by Taz. Hello. Tyson, Hassan, Flipped Burger. What's going on? Hopefully, I can help you guys. Right, D pods, wax, Mac three. Good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Please let us know where you're from, especially if you're new to the stream. Like it looks like Trey from Dallas is here today. I want to go over what the game plan is for the Fed. Right, like yesterday was unbelievable in every sense. Right, even older guys like me hadn't seen many moves where, you know, stocks went from, you know, down 5% to unchanged, right? The last time I think I remember that uh, was 1997, although I'm sure it happened a lot during 2008. So just letting people join on here, we've got Vancouver, Canada, who wants to end the Fed. I would really like to end the Fed uncertainty. Aiken is here. All right, we have Sweden, Ireland. Ireland, hello, right? Israel is here along with Queensland, Australia, right? At 3 a.m. So hats off to our friends from Australia, right? We have Canada, California, and Turkey. London, England is here. And I know I've got lots of friends in England as well as Calgary and Mexico, all right? And India is here, I'm sure, late at night. We thank you for that. Now let's get into our market update. Today, it's the tale of two cities. All right. On one hand, you have legacy and its fantasies. And then we have crypto, which, you know, in some ways looks like it wants to tell legacy to go to hell <laughs> based on how crypto performed yesterday. So what we're going to do is this. We're going to start by talking about the Fed and legacy. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about the Fed. And then I want to give you an altcoin plan because obviously I can want, 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 want all I want, right? But the Fed is going to be the ultimate decision maker as to what happens next. Now, from yesterday, you can see a theme we've been talking about on the show, which is fear of being short. Fear of being short feeds a bear market, right? Because when everyone is afraid to be short, they cover, right? They buy. And then people who are bullish buy. So if everyone buys and the market turns lower, who's left to buy? No one. That's why the market goes down because of the fear of being short. Now, yesterday was a completely extreme example of the fear of being short and naturally, right, <laughs> it happens just when I get done on the air, hence my new Zen Bowl. All right. Now, with all that said, let's take a look at what guys who, who are at sort of my age level are saying about yesterday's reversal. So Jim Bianco helped me get one of my first jobs in the market. Okay. He's a bond guy. And bond guys are kind of organically bearish equities, okay? 
So, <laughs> you know, they never met a, bond, a, a stock market mess that they didn't like. All right, that said, this is what Jim Bianco said about yesterday's reversal. He did some historical deep dive. Some confusion about which one is different. 1987, 2008, and 2020 all saw stocks decline more than 30%. The decline stopped when the Fed came in, in all three cases, and cut rates massively, or printed a whole bunch of money in the case of 2008 and 2020. Now, Jim is noting that this stock market decline is only 10% if you look at S&P, and not only is the Fed not stepping in to stop it, but they're also talking about hiking rates and printing less money. So I know that they love their fantasies over in legacy that the Fed is going to come save them after a 10% decline. And in their defense, that's worked since 2008, right? If you BTFD in equities, when everybody got bearish after a 10% decline, you know, you made huge returns. So I don't blame them, but, you know, when you actually look at the numbers and think about what the Fed's got to do, right? My daughter's birthday cake, a gluten-free, dairy-free birthday cake that was 10 inches around was $70. <laughs> so if, if the inflation rate's at 7% and interest rates are about zero, the Fed has got to do something about that. Now, you might ask, well, what are they going to do? Well, my thinking is they got to come in and talk tough, okay? In other words, investment banks think the Fed's going to hike rates six or seven times over the course of the next 18 months. That's not going to happen. They can't do that. Just the thought of a rate hike blew up crypto 50%. The equities went down 10% right? Just the thought of it. They haven't done anything yet. So I don't know if they can do six rate hikes, not to mention the fact that there's an election in the United States in November. So Jay Powell's boss, that would be Joe Biden and the Democratic Party, they're having a hard time. Their poll numbers are not good. So what's Jay going to do after July, right? Is he going to come in and hike rates in September, two months before an election and wreck the market? No, he's not going to do that. He's got to get whatever he's got to get done between now and July, which probably means a couple rate hikes. And he's got to scare everybody because they really can't do more than two rate hikes. Now, you're out there going, gee, Bill, that's kind of that's grim. Why does he have to scare everybody, right? Okay, well, let's read this. This is from CNBC today. If they want to tighten financial conditions, they want to slow inflation, Okay, they have to change what's going on in housing. Okay, the number one contributor to inflation in 2022 is going to be housing related inflation. Okay, so that's a forecast. You know, he's like, prices at the grocery store might normalize, you know, prices at the pump may stabilize. All right, but housing prices and rent, people's biggest expense, does nothing but go up. Okay, so he's talking about housing and rental as of now is already up 4% on an annualized basis. So 2022 housing prices are already moving at a four, an up 4% clip with interest rates at zero. Okay, the Fed's primary channel for slow. Let's look at home building stocks, okay? Let's take a look at this. This is XHB, a home builder ETF. So it's one instrument in legacy that has all these home building companies in. Now, as you can see, this thing rallied from 56 to 87, which is a big move for uh, like a normal legacy stock ETF. So it started last year at 56 and it went to 87. And now it broke a trend line and it returned to that trend line on yesterday's gymnastics. And today it's below the trend line. So yes, they got the shorts. 
Yeah, they stopped everybody out. But the fact of the matter is, this thing is at 75, and it's still kind of close to its high, right? Especially its high back in May and September. It's really not that far away. This thing's trading at 75, and, you know, it, it was at roughly 80-ish for most of last year. So Jay Powell has got to get XHB down, right? He's got to do something to slow down housing. And the only way to do that is to do a couple rate hikes before July and talk tough. Now, if he talks tough tomorrow, right, what's the market going to do? That's why the market's freaking out today. Now, or at least not the stock market, not crypto. So as of the recording of this show, stocks were down 2%, unwinding part of yesterday, but crypto's holding up strong. More on that later. Okay, this is the yield on the two-year government bond. So this particular interest rate or this particular bond is very sensitive to what the Fed does. Now, as you can see by that little red circle, the two-year government bond yield didn't do much over the last two days. So stocks are down 5%, then they go back up. The two-year note yield does nothing. It hangs in there. Why? Well, because on this chart, on this weekly chart, there's no resistance, right? So back, work with me here. If there's nothing to stop the two-year note yield from going from 1% to 1.4%, how does it get there? How would it get there? Well, Jay Powell's got to come in and talk tough, right? He's got to say, we're doing a rate hike in Mark. We're doing all these rate hikes, whatever he's going to say, right? He's going to say, don't think you're going to scare me away with the stock market because, you know, he can only act so many times. So he's got to talk tough now. Now, this instrument is called a Euro dollar futures contract. Basically, when rates go up, this thing goes down. And as you can see in the red circle, Okay, it's actually been going down now for three days. So with all the gymnastics in crypto, with everything going on in legacy and everything blowing up, this thing is resuming its orderly path, indicating higher interest rates. Okay, now let's go to monkey market, aka equities. Okay, down to 4,000 or like 4,200 on S&P futures, and then all the way back up. Now, really, all that happened yesterday was a simple 38% retracement of the big down move that's happened lately. So from a technical analysis point of view, what happened yesterday was completely normal in equities. It was not normal in the fact they did it in two hours or three hours, <laughs> okay? But it was a normal retracement. So either equities are going to bounce because people are going to buy the dip, right? The counter argument is it's not a bull market unless you can buy a dip and make money. So if everybody buys today's dip and the Fed doesn't scare everyone tomorrow, then it'll be par for the course in equities. And that will, of course, be super good for crypto. More on that in a minute. Just a note on European equities. No real bounce, right? Most of this occurred yesterday when they were closed. But European equities, uh, SX, SXXP, the European version of the S&P, still looks like bowling ball falling out of a window. The euro, okay, the euro in the foreign exchange market continues to go down. As a matter of fact, if you look at the yellow box on the left and then the yellow box on the bottom right, you can see that the euro has just done a false breakout above the red line, which is its 50-day moving average. The last time on the left that the euro did a false breakout, the ensuing move was rather huge. Okay, the euro just kept dropping. Now, why does this matter? Well, because there could be mass selling in European assets in order to come over to the U.S. legacy world and get, I don't know, a positive return for your money. Everything in Europe has a negative yield. Now, and then, of course, there's Vladimir Putin on everyone's border in the Ukraine. And I read yesterday that the real scary thing about that may not just be the military thing, but that natural gas prices in Europe could double if that situation gets worse. So European stocks could, could go down. The euro could go down, which would cause the dollar to go up. Now, this is the big thing, right? Like, what am I going to look at when the Fed comes out other than crypto? Well, you got to look at DXY or the euro, 
right? You know, the dollar index broke below its 50-day moving average, and now it's coming back. And despite the fact that we all want to hate the dollar, it's done nothing but go up since May. So if the dollar continues to go up, especially after they did kind of this huge give-up trade where they stopped everyone out, which the foreign exchange market is famous for, I know we've taken it to a new level in crypto in terms of stop fishing, but in legacy, right, all the stop fishing happens in currencies, in foreign exchange. So if the dollar continues to go higher, that's not good for crypto. So we got rates want to go higher, stocks want to go lower, and the dollar wants to go up as of today. Okay, now let's talk about sort of that, you know, not so good side about crypto. If you look at Bitcoin, all yesterday was, was stopping out all the weekend shorts. So if you look at the yellow square in the center of the picture, that shows all the downside price action over the weekend. So what did they do yesterday? Well, they just stopped everybody out, okay? And now it's sitting below uh, a key FIB and GAN were, were like level at like 37 and a half K. So if Bitcoin takes out that level and starts to go up, that's awesome because there is a possibility legacy could go down or do nothing and crypto could go up after the Fed, okay? Here is Ethereum. Now, Ethereum is really weird because it's making a diamond formation, right, at the bottom of a range, which is really weird. 2450 to 2400 is a key GAN zone. I don't like seeing ETH sitting around that level. I would love to see ETH above 2500. I'd sleep a lot better. From a GAN point of view, ETH sitting near, like, in between like 2,400 and 2,450 is not good. All right. Now it's time to drink some crypto Kool-Aid. <laughs> all right. Time for a different kind of segment where we just say, all right, let's say everything I just said was horseshit, right? Let's just forget about the Fed and only look at crypto. Bitcoin dominance, right, is coming off a low from April of 2018, all right? So when Michael Saylor says, sell every other asset other than Bitcoin, and he says, I'm never selling, and his average price between 33 and 35K act as support, maybe Bitcoin could go up if legacy goes down. Maybe, right? Maybe this whole idea that crypto's down 50% or 60% or more and legacy is only down 10%, means crypto could bounce, right? Okay, if you look at ETH, ETH hit a support point around 2,400, ran the stops, what else is new, okay? And now it's just sitting there. So, you know, somebody might say, all right, well, you know what? I'm gonna, uh, I bought some ETH at 3,000, I'm gonna buy some more ETH at 2,400. And I don't care what happens with the Fed because they can't blow up the world, right? And crypto forever. Now, if somebody said that to me, I'd be like, well, you might want to be a little bit careful. Then again, sometimes the best buying opportunities are the ones that are scary. Cosmos. Cosmos hit a support point near $27.40. So this is a good time to look at the chart and say, all right, you know, you don't know sometimes where support is until after the event, right? Until after the event. You know, you can draw lines, but, you know, what line is the market respecting? So it respected $27.40 in Cosmos. Cosmos is hanging around around $36, okay? And that that's kind of where Cosmos has been for the last, say, three months. There's been a couple dips. So if the market does take off, Cosmos could go to 50. If the market doesn't take off, all right, and there's a big dip, you have to be at least cognizant of the fact that Cosmos has outperformed massively, right? The whole market went down and Cosmos didn't move. Now we've covered this, right? And we're super bullish on Cosmos, but you just have to be aware that if there's a mess after the Fed, 
right? Sometimes the stuff that outperforms gets smacked. That said, if we're doing crypto only, right? 50 is possible in Cosmos. Now for Polkadot fans out there, right? Taz says AVAX is killing me. All right. I know AVAX coming up in a minute. All right. You know, Polkadot has got good support at 15. Polkadot didn't hold any support all year. So it really looks actually kind of good because it's been destroyed and it's on support. Same thing for helium, right? Helium hit support around 21. It'd be better if helium was above 26. Okay. But, you know, I mean, helium was at 56 and it's now at 21. <laughs> and it's like impossible to get bearish on this thing. Polka dots kind of the same way, right? Look at chain link. Chain link went from 28 to 15, right? Everybody gave up on chain link and there's support there. So if someone was like, all right, you know, I got to be long something. I can't deal with it. I got to get involved. Well, chain link, Bitcoin, you know, some of this like more conservative stuff may be the way to go. Near protocol. Okay. It looks like nine was support, right? So, you know, I can draw the trend line in retrospect, right? 13 and a half is really the big level where near could go, but support in single digits held. Right. And I know that this is something that everybody wants to buy. I mean, it's a 50% off sale. I mean, if it was at 20 and it's now at 11, right? If somebody was like, oh my God, I got, I got to buy some of this and, and take my chances on the Fed. And I'd be like, huh, I can't blame you. Right. Why not? Right. Look at Solana. Right. For all the negative stuff in Solana, Solana held a support point at 80. Right. That was kind of the last dip before the parabolic, right? Right at 80. Now, Solana would look better if it was above 100. I kind of would prefer to buy crypto higher after the Fed, right? In other words, if this thing was going to go up between now and the next Fed meeting, if we were going to do the everything is all right trade, well, I would kind of like to confirm that everything actually is all right. But if you're like, dude, you know, like, you know, double digit Solana, I got to get involved again. I don't blame you because support was at 80. If it goes below 80 and they wash the whole thing out, that's, you know, that's whatever. Now, personally, I was kind of hoping yesterday that they would just kill it, that they would kill it more than they already did. And that that would be it, right? They would, you know, it'd be like down, down, down. The Fed would come out and say something and then up. They just did it two or three days early. Okay. I was, I wanted them because I was watching Benjamin Cohen yesterday. I was kind of hoping for like 25K Bitcoin. Just run all the stops, scare everybody. And then it's basically over. That's one of his videos, right? It was either, you know, 30, 35, 25, or 20. The lower it goes, the higher it can turn around and rebound. That's what he said. And that's exactly what I was thinking. All right. But, you know, you got to develop your own game plan. Support held 80 in Solana. Now, for people suffering with AVAX, the good news is there was support at 60. That was the old Feb high. Naturally, they had to go down and run all the stops below 60 before coming back above it. Realistically, if people are trapped above, I would want to see AVAX above 74 for getting bullish. Now, if AVAX does go to 74 off kind of a neutralish Fed statement and it doesn't get above 74, then you have to ask yourself, you know, how big or how much do I want to hold of this coin? So selling rallies is also an idea if you're hosed and you don't know what's going to happen for, say, the next three to six months, right? Part of what I said on my Twitter is, when the market gives you a, mar a rally like it did yesterday, that could be a chance to take money off the table. So let's, let's review. I don't want to confuse you. Support at 60 held in AVAX, that's bullish. It will be more bullish if it was above 74, right? Now, if crypto sits and doesn't go anywhere, then any rally might be a way 
for people who are underwater to get some to get some psychological relief, right? In other words, the next crypto up move, if there is one, you're going to know how many people are trapped. And the best example or the best indicator of whether people want to buy the dip or whether there's a bunch of people trapped will probably be how AVAX performs at 74 and Solana performs at 100 if it gets there. Now, Phantom, which is basically taking over DeFi, hit support, which I think we had at $1.95 and is now back above another support at $2.27. So obviously, if the market goes up, Phantom's probably going to four. If the market doesn't go up, I'm guessing they're going to run stops below $1.95 because I'm sure people are getting levered long in this and I don't blame them, right? I mean, if this is the trade and we're thinking to hell with legacy, then, you know, phantom to four is reasonable. Now, do you want to do that trade in front of a Fed decision when, you know, <laughs> rates are at zero and inflation is at 7%? Uh, I wouldn't, but, you know, I know some traders who are aggressive, right? I mean, if, if we take a view that it's crypto forever, that to hell with legacy we're buying, which I, I love, I love that attitude, okay? then yeah, you get involved. You get good projects at good entry points, ignore the noise. That's a, that's a legit plan, especially if you have stable coins to put to work, right? Matic, okay, totally destroyed, was as high as 280 and it's now back at $1.47 sitting on a trend line. Okay, you've been paid to buy these cryptos on trend lines and there may be a stop fishing exercise after the Fed but I have a really hard time looking at Matic going, you know, Jesus, how, how do you get bearish at $1.40 when it was at $2.80? You can't. You just can't. I mean, maybe it's the same thing with Phantom and AVAX and all these layer ones. I mean, there's nothing worse than a late bear. So the question is, do you buy now or do you buy, say, at the end of the first week of February, right? Do, do you let this like fear trade last two weeks or do you get involved now? Okay, Luna, same thing, right? We talked about Luna being a buy at 50. That was actually Medi's idea. They wicked it down there, right? And now it's sort of holding at 60, which is also a big fib number. So if Luna was at 100, right? And now it's at 60, you don't need a chart, do you? <laughs> Right? I mean, if we're doing crypto Kool-Aid, right, Luna's a buy. Now, if we're not doing crypto Kool-Aid, you know, it may pay to wait, right? I mean, because imagine if you can get Luna below 50. You know, it's one thing to be short. Uh, it's another thing to be bullish and patient, right? It's better to buy it if the Fed doesn't scare everybody. I mean, how much room does crypto have to go up? A lot. So you can have a small position. I'd be in favor of small crypto long positions with the idea that if those positions worked, you add to them. Okay, nano, don't laugh, right? Bullish stochastics divergence, okay, has actually been up three days in a row after getting wasted over the weekend. And I'm wondering if that down move over the weekend, all right, was a liquidity event. Matter of fact, I'm wondering if everything that happened over this last weekend was a liquidity event. Okay. VeChain. I just can't give up on VeChain, right? I thought nine cents was going to hold. The market checked me and it went four. And I'm sitting here looking at this and go, <laughs> like, what am I going to do? Go on TV and say I'm bearish, bearish VeChain at four cents? Oh my God, please. I can't do that. I just can't do it, right? It's like, you know, I, I wish it's just crypto only. And in some cases, these small altcoins, it may just be the hell with the Fed. I mean, what does the future of VeChain have to do with interest rates? Nothing. Okay, Ave, another totally destroyed coin. It's totally destroyed. And as of like before the recording, it was trading terrible. But as we've seen the last couple of days, there's this like noon shift, right? I get on the air. And the market likes to shift or pump. So, I mean, if, if there's a way to bring Ave back to life, the technical picture is actually okay. 
that huge puke below 140 probably was a stop fishing exercise. So again, this thing was at 250 two weeks ago, and now it's at 140. You know, when I look at this chart, I go, you know what? If there was ever a thing, right, ever a thing as out of legacy into crypto, it would be now. Seriously, right? I mean, legacy assets are smoking something if they think the Fed is going to back down after a 10% move. But crypto that's been totally destroyed, particularly these DeFi and layer one plays could be interesting. Now, I don't want you to get hosed. You know, I know we're drinking crypto Kool-Aid, right? But I don't want you to get killed and keep your positions manageable. Casper, which I know people are asking about on the stream. Okay. Honestly, I think there's been a give up trade in Casper, right? People have just totally packed it in. Like, you know, they just said, okay, you know, I thought this was going to hold nine was support and I just gave up. So if the market goes up, I actually think this can go up a lot. Really? This is like V chain. It's like, you know, wh where's the price target if it goes down zero? I don't know. You know what I'm saying? It's just really hard to get too bearish, right? On some of these small altcoins when you look at them by themselves. Perp. Oh my God. You know, this has happened in perp before. It happened in July of last year. Okay. Um, perp went all the way down to $5.75, right? Now, maybe Perp is telling you that there's no appetite for derivatives and hedging because the down moves over. Like if I could point to a crypto chart that said, okay, this says the down moves over. It might be the fact that Perp fell out of bed. Now that said, you know, Perp is down at $5.75 and it's sitting on a GAN point. And I'm like, hey, Maybe it's time to start liking perp again, right? I haven't said much about it. I noted it, you know, that it was holding during the decline. Thank God it didn't shill it too hard because it fell out of bed, but it fell out of bed so hard that's like, oh my God, you know, how can you not put 2% of your portfolio in perp, not investment advice? That doesn't mean put all your money in perp, right? I know the gas fees are expensive, but still, you know, all right, that's your market update. All right, all right, yeah. Routine cheese says DYDX pumped and then capitulated. That's right. Okay. Let's see. We got a couple people here who do want to reload their perp. Okay. K Tours says reload perp. All right. Time to dwell on XRP. Okay. Routine cheese says Forrest likes nano. Yes, that was that's Forrest big play. Jonah Curie says Matic to five. Okay, love the conviction there. Carlin is asking that we smash the like button, right? Because that helps us get the message out, right? And gets gets this video into the hands of people who need it. Okay. Jonah wants to actually hold AVAX and Luna long-term. Okay, that's a point I didn't bring up, right? If there is a total debacle off the Fed, this is the type of a market where long-term hodlers can start coming in, right? In other words, whether it's the bottom now or later, all right, or now or in two weeks, you know, long-term, think about it. Long-term, if you bought Bitcoin at 12K, 10K and 8K, even though those numbers in percentage terms are very far away from each other, <laughs> long term, does it matter? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. Okay. So, you know, long term investors can probably start taking advantage of what's going on here. Probably, right? You know, they could get some now. And if there's a blow up after the Fed, they can move in after that. Okay, let me share my screen and see how this chart program comes up. And let's see if I can help people with some of their requests. So somebody's asking for IOTA. I'm going to use the daily chart.
All right, now bear with me because I definitely want you to answer. I definitely want to answer your questions. And I know how it works that, you know, if I answer questions, you hit the like button. So let's scratch each other's back and do that. Okay, IOTA had resistance at $1.20 and then it completely fell out of bed. So where is support in IOTA, All right? Probably right there, right here, okay? So support was at 70 cents, uh, 68 cents, and it looks like people were coming in and buying it. Now, this is a good time to bring something up, right? Actually, I'm going to do something crazy, and I'm going to blow these candlesticks up the size of the whole screen, okay? Now, let's take a look at some of these candles. Let's talk just candlestick theory for a moment. So this obviously is a hammer candlestick, right? And that's awesome looking, right? It looks amazing. You go, you open up, you go all the way down, you come all the way back, right? And these candles are everywhere. Iota doesn't look as good as others, but it's still a reversal. Okay, now in candlestick theory, they say, that when you get a reversal, the key is follow through, right? In other words, are people willing to pay higher prices? Are they? Okay. Let's look at crypto.com. Okay. Now in crypto.com, people are willing to pay higher prices. Right, you have this, okay, and crypto.com is up 10% because this right here was probably a give up trade. And that was the support point where the entire rally started from. So, again, if you missed crypto.com and you just got to have it, which it looks like people do, right? Perp down, crow up means the crypto market thinks that this down moves over. It's as simple as that, right? In crypto.com, people are willing to pay higher prices after the reversal. Okay, let's take a look at, at VRA. I got a nifty list here of stuff that people are looking for. Okay, so again, right? So we have VRA up here on the screen. All right, here's an example down here where there was a reversal and people were willing to pay higher prices. All right, now in VRA, you get these reversals, but then it doesn't, it doesn't get past the trend line. Now, in fairness to anybody who's bullish this, if we kind of like zoom in a little bit, what's going on here looks like what was going on here back in September, right? And this actually is even more bullish in this area because I would call it a bullish downward sloping wedge. In other words, bears hate it so much that they're like sitting on it. So I don't want to give you false hope in front of the Fed because veracity has been unable to break out. But... If VRA is above, say, three cents, right? Just get it on the camera here. And, you know, this can go up. I mean, right now, it's like bears are just like, they're sitting on it. Now, frequently, when you have a downward sloping wedge, take a basketball, you stick it underwater, right? You have to push it, push it down. But as soon as you let go of it, it pops out. So if there ever was such a thing in veracity, right? And VRA as a positive catalyst, if that showed up and a big rally started, you could blow out a lot of bears. Okay. Now that said, right, there's bullish potential. All right. But where is people's willingness to pay higher prices? Crypto.com is probably the only place as of today where people are willing to, you know, really sort of like pay up to get involved. Okay, Moon River has gotten totally destroyed. So let's take a look if we can at that. This is 
probably a really big pain trade. All right. So from a technical analysis point of view, what is working in Moon River? Um, basically nothing. <laughs> nothing. Nothing seems to be working. So let's try to draw that, right? There's a trend line off a big low in September, right? And another one here. So we did a 100X show. Mehdi actually interviewed somebody involved with this. And a lot of people gave up on Moon River, right? Here's the give up trade, right? Just straight up. Like people who have watched the show know what the give up trade looks like. It's just basically down, you know, every single day, right? Now, <laughs> how, how do you get bearish river after something like that? Well, I, I mean, Moon River did completely fall out of bed here. So it's not like it can't go down and keep going down. But what's the point in selling Moon River at 79? If anything, there might be a point in buying Moon River at 79. And if you're long it and you're trapped, then you stop out, you know, on any new low off the Fed and maybe come back in two weeks. But I mean, when you see something as destroyed as this, right? Particularly since, you know, I, I'm pretty sure that if I draw this horizontal line here, I mean, really. That was the first place you could buy it after it came out, right? It launched, it went straight up, and then it came back down. And then that point was the first point where you could buy it. So it's almost like in Moon River, you're at square one. That's why it's so hard to be bullish. Okay, I'm sorry. It's so hard to be bearish crypto just because of a legacy problem. Okay, let's take a look at See if I can get a look at Glimmer, GLMR. Not a lot of price action to work with here. Let me see if I can get a better chart. Okay, whoops. All right, coming up. Okay, I don't have a lot of price action on this, so I'm switching to an intraday chart. Okay, so this, like many small altcoins, right? When you see these destroyed trades, all right, you're always looking for some type of momentum divergence. But I'm guessing that this right here was people giving up between eight and a half and six. All right, if it was at 15, right, and it goes to six or five, <coughs> it's kind of tough to be bearish, especially when this thing looks like it actually wants to go up, all right? And people want to pay higher prices, okay? Let's get XRP up here. <clears throat> all right, so this is XRP. So nobody wants to pay higher prices, but it looks like people are buying the dip, right? If you look at the short-term chart, right? This is 89 minutes. So let me pull this up and label it for people who are watching the video later. Okay, this is XRP and this is 89 minutes, all right? Now, what you can see when you look at the chart, down at the bottom, okay, this looks like a base. And it's only two days, right? So it's either a base or it's a big fake out. <clears throat> People want to buy crypto. Crypto wants to go up, right? In other words, when you see this type of price action, that is everybody just throwing the towel in on XRP, right? Big YouTubers were into it. Right, this happened in Cardano. Everybody gives up and then it forms like a base. 
All right, now it really hasn't paid to buy XRP when it's up. But like I said, what does XRP have to do with the Fed? Probably nothing. Now, of course, if Bitcoin and ETH gets wrecked, you know, you're going to be looking at XRP at 56 cents. But if you look at this chart, I mean, at the start of the year, XRP was at 85 cents. So if you look at it this way, I mean, how, how do you get negative XRP? How, how do you get negative? I mean, you can get negative if, if the SEC comes in and wrecks them in court. That is, of course, a risk. But, I mean, this is a classic example of something that has a loyal following, maybe a little bit like VeChain. So, I mean, that's my two cents on XRP. Okay, someone's also asking for Tezos. Something that I really wish would go up one day. Okay, and again, it's this whole idea that people, People just, you know, they gave up, right? Like this right here. This is everybody giving up. And this is the people who are bullish coming back in. Now, again, it's an 89-minute chart, right? So by the time people watch this, say a day or two later, you know, that may or not be the case, right? In other words, do people want to pay higher prices for Tezos? They want to buy the dip. That seems obvious, right? Because if you look right here, okay, this was the prior high from back in July. So this right here, okay, like $3 was where the start of the last give up trade was in Tezos back in July. So who wants to get bearish Tezos this close to its July low after being as high as $9 since October. Uh, nobody. Okay, now that said, again, folks, it's nice to make a candle, right? And it's probably going to do nothing for the next two days, right? But once I shut the video off, the question is, the crypto that I'm looking at, do I see evidence that they're willing to pay higher prices? If you see legacy go down or do nothing and people are willing to pay higher prices for crypto coming off the lows, that's bullish for crypto and your coin. If people are not willing to pay higher prices, then you have to at least accept the fact that this latest rally was a bullshit bear market rally, right? So this is where I want my Jersey accent to echo in your head. Obviously, it's almost impossible to get bearish some of these coins. But that said, bulls have to come in. Bulls have to take charge. And, and, and you're smart enough to know, especially if you've got some of these navigation points, where bulls may or may not come in. Now, let's see if I can look at Curve. I know that there's a governance token, and that may be what people are interested in. So let me see if I can find that. That's probably what everyone's talking about, the Curve DAO token. Okay, hoping I've got the right picture here. You know, again, it kind of goes straight down, and here's your trend line. So, you know, as with all these cryptos, there's the stop loss selling. There's everybody quitting. This is curve daily. And it looks like people want to pay higher prices. So I mean, for the moment, this is okay. So if there's no problem with the Fed, right? How quickly can this unwind itself? Because everybody puked it, right? So this has got more upside potential, assuming I've got the right symbol. All right, let's see what else in the chat. Let's see who's here, okay? See who I can say hello to. First of all, Poach, I, I, I definitely appreciate you being on the stream, okay? We have New Zealand in the house. That's probably really late at night, along with India and Switzerland. Switzerland, I'm tracking that interest. I'm tracking that currency rate between the euro and the Swiss franc. You know, I, don't, I try not to bore my, I try not to get too nerdy on legacy okay 
uh, on my crypto stream. <laughs> Daniel Ramos says it's it's not legacy, it's stonks. Okay, we can go with stonks. All right, and we have a whole bunch of other people here. Somebody is asking for a kala. Let's take a look and see if I can find that. Let's take a look at Akala. Folks, don't forget to hit the like button. Don't forget to remember, you know, who loves you, right? Who who gives you on-demand TA, all right? Uh, I'm not getting a lot of price action on Akala, so I'm probably going to have to switch off that. Let's see what else, who's coming in now. Oh, yeah, KDA. I know we've got some KDA fans out there. So let's talk about speculative layer ones, right? In other words, hey, now, when we look at KDA, what do we see? All right, let's take a look at a daily chart. All right, so KDA is doing lots of reversal candles, right? It's below support, right? Really, the support zone was 565. That's where the support really was. But, you know, KDA, or actually it was below, say, six. So I know this is painful, right? Because this got, you know, this went all the way up and all the way back down. Now let's try to draw a fib retracement on this. Good Lord. All right. Try to draw a fib retracement on this thing to see where it's at. So, if it retraced the whole thing, all right. Now, trying to find what works <laughs> in markets like this can be like extremely difficult. Now, if you want to be constructive on this and you want to believe that this is like some sort of gigantic flag, then it's probably got to jump back into the flag and get back above six. So for this, if there's no Fed problem, it's probably going to jump back above six and go to 9.4, right? So with, the, with, with KDA, it's either going to really pump or it's really going to dump, right? Because there isn't a whole lot of support below six. So it's hanging tough, but you really want to see it above six before you get excited. Now, if you bought this thing much higher, which probably a lot of people did, that's okay, right? Everybody gets hosed. Everybody gets wrecked. Everybody on the stream is probably wrecked. That's okay. Or, or down on something. But that said, in KDA, you know, if you bought it at 16, right? and you've got any capital left and you believe in it, if it gets above six, that's the place to jump in. But remember, it's got to get above six and stay above six. Okay. I also see somebody asking for Rune, AKA Heartbreaker coin. Rune just flat out broke my heart. It's up 7% today. Okay. So I get involved in Rune on a GAN point which I'm actually taking this GAN line out and I'm taking this line out too. Okay. So the August low, let's go to a two day chart. Okay. So if we look at a two day chart in Rune, it's, it's impossible for me to get bearish Rune at this level. Right. This is why people are picking it up. All right. Around four. And I, I look at this and I'm like, this is probably going to be a component of the future of DeFi. And when the Fed gymnastics are over, right. You know, I mean, everybody, I mean, look at the give up trade in this. It's probably hard to see because it's a two day chart. But I mean, this is just everyone packing it in. It's me getting stopped out. That's everybody. Of course, you get stopped out right into major support, right? Like here's support from what? Like, look at this. Here's support from July. 
And here's support from February, right? So if people are willing to pay higher prices for Rune, right? I mean, if it gets going on the upside, that's awesome. Like the best thing that could happen to this market is Bitcoin sits still and the rally would be in the altcoins. That's probably going to require positive stock market action. It's a guess, or at least in speculative stocks like ARKK. So I know, I, I know you want altcoins, and I don't want everybody to just tune me out here, but let's let's just take a second to see how the altcoin of the stock market is doing today, right? So, you know, for a while I've been saying this is bowling ball out of a window. Okay. There was a gap back in June of 2020. They just filled that gap and let's check what's going on, right? How are the altcoins of the equity market? So these are very speculative coins, right? I'm sorry, very speculative stocks. How are the speculative stocks trading today? Okay. Now I'm bringing this up for a reason, right? Because in this stuff, it looks like a bear market rally. Now, this doesn't look as good as crypto, right? Crypto, like XRP, you know, it's trying to make a base. ETH is making a diamond, okay? Now, this looks terrible, right? This is kind of like, you know, this candlestick formation on the 89-minute chart of ARC, right? It means, you know, people are selling at any chance they get. Right, so you just have to remember that when you do an altcoin trade, you don't necessarily have to be in a hurry. All right, somebody asking for Sandbox. Let's check it out. What's happening in Sandbox? Okay, again, this is an 89-minute chart. So if you're looking at this three days from now, it may not be as valuable, but the tactical viewpoint has been helpful. It has been. All right, now with Metaverse, right? Because metaverse is highly speculative, you got to ask yourself, right? Do I want to get involved if it's above resistance or at resistance? You want to get involved above resistance. So in sandbox, you know, you really want to see the thing take out, say, like 320. Okay, let's, let's use 320 as a level. So if you see above 320, that means sandbox is breaking out. Because this is all the hedging from this weekend, right? This is everybody getting out over the weekend, right? And those people, if they use this, if they were able to short this, okay, they're still okay. What you want to see in crypto is you want to see the shorts get blown out, all right? I did do, uh, I did do dot, dot actually looks okay. It actually looks okay with support at 15. Now, just taking a break to look at the chat. Okay, we have Croatia, London, Greece, and Australia here, along with Argentina. All right, Mexico, India. How you doing? Welcome. All right, R-N-D-R -R with three R's next to it. Venture capital people did a wonderful job of hosing everybody in this, didn't they? I mean, I think I think these guys got invested in R and DR like right here. I think this was the R and DR rally at six. Okay, so let me label this because this is a daily chart of R and DR. All right. So. You know, naturally, as you may have told, Mehdi had said this, he was pretty skeptical up here because venture capitalists were able to invest at 30 cents, literally. So it's trading at $6. They got to invest at 30 cents. Nice, huh? And then they dropped the bag on everyone's head. Now, let's take a look at this. So again, you know, here is the reversal candle. And here is the trend line. So in RNDR, is this a flag? <laughs> How hard is it to get bearish RNDR at these price levels? There's nothing worse than a late bear, which I may have been guilty of yesterday, right? 
The fact of the matter is, with crypto this destroyed after that kind of reversal, I mean, if you thought RNDR was a good investment at $6, at $2, it's got to look really cheap. Now, if two days from now, RNDR is still inside this formation, in other words, if the Fed comes out scary but neutral or scary and things don't go down. See, if you're in the metaverse, right? You're saying, okay, I'm in the most speculative stuff. When I look at the Fed, what do I do? Well, if you're in the most speculative stuff, you want to see, does stuff go straight down? Because if it does, you got a problem. But if everything jumps around and your speculative coin at least holds, and then you start to see green, that's something you go with. That's why the title of this video is Fed Plan for Altcoins. All right? MOVR has broken my heart in seven places. Yes, sir. I feel for you out there. I'm going to try to do the best I can. I know there's a lot of altcoins that have really taken it on the chin. Okay. K Tours is asking about FTT. Okay. So let's take a look at the FTX coin, which before this debacle, I was thinking could become the next Binance coin. Now, of course, second I said that, and I remember the stream where I said it, naturally, like everything, right? When you buy strength, you get totally effed. It's totally effed, right? Now let's try a trend line redraw. Yeah, sometimes folks, you just have to like redraw the trend line. You have to look to see if the market is respecting what you are looking at. Okay, so that's kind of pushing it, right? It's interesting that, you know, there was an attempt to get above it there and it failed. But you could say in FTT that this is a bump and run. It's a stretch, but you could say it. You could say it, right? That, you know, if this thing looked like the new Binance coin at 48, I don't see how it could not be a buy at 32. So in other words, <laughs> fingers crossed. Okay, let's ring the Zen bell. Fingers crossed. If there is a debacle into February or into the end of the month, right? I'm thinking that FTX is something that you want to grab, right? In other words, I couldn't blame anybody who wanted to buy the dip at 32. Now, you have to recognize that, you know, this Fed thing is really weird. But if you hadn't been involved in if FTT and you missed it and you're like, oh my God, you know, now I can get in. There's at least decent support, okay, just below, say, 30, just above 30. So you might be able to get some and use a stop, right? And if this winds up working out, I mean, if this is a major crypto low and it's going to go up into March, then obviously FTT is a steal. Now, I realize it sounds like I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth, and I know that people on crypto in YouTube, you know, they want like definitive statements. They want me to, to like curse at you and tell you that this is absolutely definitely going to happen. Well, anybody who's telling you that ahead of the Fed is smoking something. Right? That said, it is really, really hard to get negative crypto after seeing these prices. And I can see legacy going down and crypto going up. All right. So Chief Sway is asking, please, could you comment on the Fed interest rate hike and tapering at the end of March? How will markets react to it along with the ever rising inflation? Okay, good question. So I've been talking about that. Let me give you the synopsis. Right now, inflation is at 7% and interest rates are at zero. Housing prices and rent are on a 4% trajectory higher. All right. How in God's name does the Fed sit there and let that happen? They don't. So to conclude the stream, the Federal Reserve has got to talk tough and hike interest rates. If they don't do that, inflation is going to get out of control. The Fed has to do whatever they're going to do before the election, which means they got to talk tough and act tough between now and July. 
it is possible for crypto to go up as equities go down, as long as it's not an equities crash. Now, me personally, I would wait until after the Fed before initiating new longs. I would also have a notepad and say, what altcoin did I buy and where am I willing to stop out of it in order to preserve capital? In other words, you want to have a plan to go up where you add to positions and a place where you say, okay, these two coins in my portfolio, if they go down after the Fed, I'm out, right? Bitcoin and Ethereum are going to follow equities. 1900 is good support in Ethereum if there's a decline. 25K is a very interesting level in Bitcoin. Okay, folks, that's it for today, okay? I want to say goodbye and I want to thank you for subscribing to Token Metrics' YouTube channel. Please turn on alerts in case we have to do an emergency live stream for the Fed. All right. Now, a final question. Aiken says, what about the $5 trillion you said was parked on the sidelines? Exactly. All right. That money could come flying into the market if the Fed goes what they call dovetard tomorrow. So that's a little kind of encore, right? That if the Fed goes dovish tomorrow, money could start flooding in. There's a lot of money out there right? But a lot of money doesn't want to lose a lot of money, right? If there was a lot of money that bought Bitcoin at 46, you know, they were probably selling yesterday. So money on the sidelines will come in if they feel safe, but I don't think it's Jerome Powell's job to make you feel safe. I think it's his job to stop inflation. So that's it for today. Goodbye to my friends in America, Asia, and UK. We will see you tomorrow.